So my mom, two brothers, sister and I decided to drive to the Grand Canyon. It was beautiful, but quite terrifying. Anyways, my mom then suggested we go to Page, Arizona to see Horseshoe Bend as she had gone months prior and wanted us to see. So we arrive, it's cool, whatever. So that night, after we see everything, my mom suggests we go look at the stars. Page is tiny. It's in the middle of nowhere. Just desert and mountains for hundreds of miles. We drove to a secluded area where there's almost no lights except for the hues, I guess, of the street lights of a bridge that wasn't too far. And oh my God, it was astonishing. Never seen anything like it. About 20 minutes of messing around, my mom suggests we drive to the Horseshoe Bend. There's no light there other than the sign. It kind of shines up from the bottom so you can see it, you know? So anyways, we get out and are just standing near the car, chatting. Whatever. At this point, we were probably there 40 minutes. And when we first got there, we had heard a cricket. And since it was so silent other than us, we were trying to find it because it sounded so close. Anyways, here's where it gets weird. My brother was sitting about 15 feet behind us on that sign he climbed on top of. And the four of us are in my mom's car. My brother sees a shooting star and yells out. About 15 seconds later, me and my mom see another shooting star at the same time. She then says something along the lines of, bet people see all sorts of crazy weird stuff out here. And as soon as she says this, the cricket stops making that noise. It's dead silent. We're all staring into the distance. There's a white light level to us. Like, someone holding a phone flashlight and it would turn off, then back on a few feet away. And it was moving around in circles slowly. We were literally all hyper-focused on this thing. None of us even said anything. I think we're all thinking, what the actual? I want to say we were staring for 20 seconds when we heard the car door open and slam shut. We all looked at each other and my brother said, what the fuck? Did that door slam shut? We're all baffled. I don't think any of us said anything. My mum walks up to the car and she's bending down, looking into the car. And my brother comes up behind her and shines his flashlight, since you couldn't really see inside. And as soon as he did that, my mum screamed at the top of her lungs and took off running. He's in there. There's someone. Naturally, we all scream. And we're all like, what the fuck? Where are we running to? My oldest brother looked again and there was nothing. And we got in and took the fuck off. We had chills and all couldn't believe it. My mom was spooked as fuck and described it as a pale dude in a driver's seat, hands on the wheel. She couldn't make out any facial features really, but to be fair, she was only peering in that window for about two seconds, tops. We didn't stop talking about it all night. About an hour later, my mom, sister and I were feeling bold and wanted to go back. Rose said no, but finally said fine, but we're not getting out. We left the hotel, go to the car to go back, and as soon as my hand touched that car, I was overcome with a nasty feeling. Came out of nowhere, and I immediately started having a panic attack. I hadn't had one in years. My family was comforting me, and it weirded them out. We didn't end up going back. So this just happened like an hour ago and I just wanted to share it with someone. So I was in my bedroom with my wife, doing the normal kiss goodnight before I went to play video games and nothing was off and my wife fell asleep shortly after. I came back into the bedroom to find these like two and a half foot long sparklers, as in fireworks, that I had laying on top of my hamper to the side of my bed, all laying all over the bed, on top of my wife who was sleeping all around her, but all on the bed and the package as well. I woke her up and asked her what the fuck she was doing with the fireworks. And she mumbled half awake that she didn't do anything and it wasn't her. So I started putting them away. I really wish I had taken a picture, but I didn't think anything of it till I had put them away already. The only way they could have been sprawled out over the bed like that is if someone threw the box onto the bed or like shook them all out over. I went back to playing video games and looked down and noticed I had a missed call from my wife's phone, but no voicemail. I asked her why she called me and she said she didn't. 
She usually recalls the next morning if she called my phone because I'm being too loud. It's only the next room, and I know I can be loud sometimes. The same night I was joking, saying that the ghosts were blowing my money around. We were playing Monopoly. And I think I may have missed something off. I just came to bed now and questioned her again about it. But she didn't remember anything. But even fully awake, she didn't know anything about the sparklers and kind of looked stunned for a second herself. This is only the newest of many strange things that have happened in this building. It's a 120 year old building that used to be an old secret society building. I hear boot prints in the ceiling. I've seen shadows. I've been grabbed physically by my face, ankles and shoulder before here. I just want to leave this place. I've lived here for like eight years and so many things have happened. But it's not just this place. I've experienced things my whole life. I think partially because my mom's a pastor and partially because these things follow me wherever I go. I can't escape it and I can't get away from the paranormal if I try. I've seen over 10 exorcisms and more experiences where I live than the normal person. I haven't been given a choice to believe in these things or not. Some people go their whole lives without experience anything. Others aren't so lucky. I wish I could just live a normal life, but these things follow me either through my life or through what my friends are going through, and they ask me for help. Starting with my personal history. My mother is a Christian pastor. However, my mind is open to all sorts of things. I believe in angels and demons, beings from other dimensions, cryptids. I just look at everything with an open mind. Ever since I was little, my mother said before I was even conceived, a pastor told her she was going to have another child. She believed she was too old for a child and scoffed it off, thinking he was crazy when he told her that her Isaac was coming. Biblical background, Isaac was the son of Moses and Sarah. His wife was too old to conceive a child, yet she did anyways. I've had multiple pastors prophecy over me, saying I was going to do great things and be a leader someday. I still think they're all crazy. But I feel this may have the least something to do with my sensitivity towards the paranormal. All my life, I've had many experiences. Good, but mostly bad. And I just feel the need to share them with people other than my family. I try not to talk about, write, or research about the things that I've experienced, as they could tend to stir things up even more. Even as I write this, I get a feeling of dread, and I hear cracks and bumps on the wall. But I just need to share this with other people, and I want to post something before I lose any more details of things I've experienced in this place. I moved into my apartment with my soon-to-be wife in 2016. We got married in 2017. With her brother, because we couldn't afford the rent by ourselves while still being young adults. It was awesome to finally have a place of our own without the constant parent breathing down our necks. My landlord shared the history of this building with me when we moved in, about how this building was an old oddfellows hall. I found later it was built in 1885, and I didn't really do any research of my own until after things started to happen. Everything was fine for a while, and I can't remember really when all the things started happening. But I do remember when I first felt the heaviness in the air and dread. There's one room in particular that felt more heavy and darker than the rest. The room where my brother-in-law slept. He never used to recall seeing or feeling anything paranormal, but he used to sleepwalk and act very strangely late at night. Now he has had many concussions from his time playing hockey, and I'm almost certain that's where this was all coming from. He had some weird episodes, but I'm attributing it to his concussions. Well in his room is where the weird stuff or at least feelings would start. When we'd be in the kitchen, you could see straight down the hall into his bedroom. But sometimes it looked like it was pitch black in there. Like a veil of darkness. The only way I could explain it. Like it felt like someone was standing in the doorway, just watching you. Well, after a while, I would try and just keep the door closed to his room. 
so I wouldn't get that feeling. But it helped for a while. In my kitchen, there's a door to our storage room, where I had a fly tying station set up because I'm a huge on fishing and fly fishing. When I'd tie flies in there late at night, I always would leave at 3am. I always have been nocturnal. Because I would always start to feel uneasy and get the same feeling I would from my brother-in-law's room. Now one time that made me think it wasn't just me. is when my cat at the time came into his bedroom with me when I had that dark heavy feeling. I entered his room, the cat with me, and my hair just stood on end like I shouldn't have been there. I looked at my cat and his hair was on end as well. So I know I wasn't the only one feeling it. I closed the door, said a prayer, and left for my bedroom. One of the most intense nights, I was up late playing video games like I always do. I can't remember the time, but it was after 2am. My animals started looking at my apartment door. I heard rustling around out there, and so did they. Kind of like when my wife is home, and she's getting ready to come in. But she was in bed. That's when I started hearing scratching outside my door. My lights inside the room I was in started flickering. I shit you not. And then I saw my dog and my cat simultaneously watching something on my ceiling go around in circles. This ties into something that I will share in a later story. After I got freaked out by my animals watching something that's not there, not a fly, not a bug or anything, I was sitting on my couch watching this happen when all of a sudden... I had what felt like two hands grab my face from behind and pull my head into the couch. As the hands were on my face, my whole face went numb, pale, like no blood was in my face anymore. It's the only way I could describe it. After that, I started to pray harder than I have ever before. I don't go to church or super religious, but I do believe in my faith and I know I have power over that stuff. I don't remember anything else happening after that other than a heavy feeling in the air and I ran to bed with my wife and explained what happened to her. We prayed and went to sleep. The next morning I found outside our apartment handprints and scratches on our walls. The landlords painted it all when we moved in and wouldn't be the type to smear up what they did with dirt. So it's very odd that these would appear after the night I heard something outside. The scratches on the wall of the hallway outside our apartments were right where our neighbor's head laid on the inside of the wall in his bed. I know, because he showed me once when I went in to look at furniture he was giving away. I never thought to ask him if he experienced anything, because I didn't want to freak him out, although I regret not asking. I wish that was where this ended, but it's not. One other instance is when me and my wife were in bed together, just reading and whatever we were doing, so we fell asleep. I like to play my Switch. When I felt the heaviness again, but that's weird, as, as soon as I felt it, she looked at me and told me she was scared, like something was in the room. I felt it too. This was the most I've ever been scared. I felt like something entered our room and started coming towards the foot of our bed with ill intentions. I was so scared. My body was literally shaking and I could barely even mutter a prayer. Like when you're in a dream and you try to tell, but nothing comes out. I prayed along the lines of, you're not welcome here. We're children of God and we're protected by his stripes. You're not allowed here and you cannot hurt us. Get out. I struggled to even get those words out, but I just continued to pray for a peaceful night and sleep. That was about the end of the worst of it. Granted, Weird stuff still happens, and weird things still make sounds. We'll hear someone with boots walking around in our attic. We see shadows peek around the doorway to the hallway that you can see our brother's room from. It's connected to our living room. Sometimes the shadows are white, sometimes they're black. Sometimes I get a weird feeling in the room I got grabbed in, and I know it's time to go to bed. I try not to stay up past 2 or 3 a.m. anymore. My brother-in-law has since moved out and my wife's sister now lives with us. And we've gotten phone calls from her where she said she saw a white shadow move past the living room doorway in the hallway and other shadows. We're looking to move this summer, not because of these things, but we have outgrown our apartment and we need a yard for our dog to run around. 
But I'll miss this place. As fascinated as I am with the paranormal, I would never want to live with the things I've lived with. I own and operate a movers company. On many occasions, we're sent to homes where the owners have passed away. The homes are older than 100 years, and the furniture has been passed down many generations. On one move from Texas to a 250-year-old home in Virginia, the house was renovated to look just like it did when built. Small ceilings, visible beams, and the hardwood floor were original. The new owner even showed us bullet holes on the outside of the house dating way back. We arrived around 4pm, and the owner told us where he wanted all the furniture, then left, and we got to work on loading. Right off the bat, we felt very uneasy in the home. Surrounded by mountains and trees, the nearest neighbours are about a mile away. There were three of us, and I was inside laying rugs before the other two brought in furniture. It got dark quick as the sun went behind the mountains. I heard footsteps on the second floor, and figured it was one of the guys going to the only working bathroom. When I walked outside, the two guys were coming in with the headboard for a bed. I asked if they were upstairs, and they both said they were taking a smoke break while I lay rugs. I shrugged it off as just the house being old. It's now pitch black outside, and the house is a historic monument to the city. Meaning, you can put so-and-so type of doors, lights, knobs, etc., we were basically working with flashlights and candles with how the house lights were. We were assembling the living room area, and when we all hear a door slam at the back of the house, we figured it was a draft, but went to check it out anyway. These doors are original and easily weigh 80 to 100 pounds each. We all start to feel unsettled as I told them about the footsteps earlier. We start to unload the truck and assemble and place all the furniture as fast as we can. Once we get upstairs, the mood changed drastically. We all felt very nervous and as if we were being watched. While assembling a bed frame from the corner of my eye, I would see shadows going back and forth. All of a sudden, we hear a loud bang upstairs. I went to look and it was my drill I had left on its side on a table that fell to the floor. We all rush outside for a cigarette and see what needs to be finished to leave quickly. All that's left is the footboard of the bed I was assembling and to take an armoire to the second floor. We plan accordingly and we're in and out within 20 minutes. There was no way someone could have come into the property because the owner had motion lights placed on the trees all around. And the only way on when we were outside and the homeowner was at a hotel 45 minutes away where I left him the keys. It's been about three years since that job and we still talk about it to this day. First incident. So a few days back, I was on a bus going back home. An ambulance passed us by, and I had an urge to cry out, like bawl out. I was so overwhelmed and had tears in my eyes, taking deep breaths to control my emotions. I couldn't explain it because one, I had nobody close to me die in my life yet, two, no trips to the hospitals, and three, no emergencies that involve ambulances. I've passed through many, many ambulances in the past and have always prayed that the person, whoever is in the ambulance, to be safe. But such a feeling never occurred. The second incident. Last night, in my roommate's perspective, I was sleeping very normal for me, and she was asking me to stop it, thinking I was awake. And I did stop talking apparently. The same thing repeated two or three times again and it stopped. Then I gasped loudly, like inhaled, and didn't exhale for at least a few seconds. And she said she could see my chest physically rise when I inhaled, and fall when exhaled. I even called my mom as if crying for help. She called me many times, and after a little time, I replied, I'm okay, I'm okay, and went back to sleep. In my perspective, the moment I heard her call my name desperately, I felt like something or someone was standing near the leg side of my bed. 
It was completely black, and as far as I remember, the silhouette had two hands and two legs and one head. I waved my hand once and away to make it go away, as if it would dissipate into the air. And I said, I'm okay, I'm okay, to find my roommate and fell asleep. I remember feeling absolutely scared and terrified, really desperate to just go away from that feeling. I remember getting goosebumps and telling myself it's nothing and I shouldn't pay attention to it. This evening, we were talking about what exactly happened. And she told me her side of the story. Even then, when I thought of what happened, I got goosebumps all over my body. Got chills and my heart was beating so fast. It's possible all these physiological reactions occurred because I perceived the situation as scary. But I'm just mentioning it so I don't miss out any details. These things have never happened to me before. What are your thoughts on it? If it's any way or has any relation to this, I usually do tarots, but haven't done it in a week or more. And these incidents have happened during the week. I hadn't done any tarot. I don't do any other spiritual or paranormal stuff. I'm usually a very positive person, but I've been stressed lately because of work. Last night, I had one of the strangest experiences of my life. Let me give some backstory before I get into what happened. In 2019, I purchased my first home. Luck really seemed to be on our side, as my fiancé and I had been looking for a year and houses were flying off the market. In September of 2018, my mom's neighbour had gone into a nursing home and the house listed for sale. There was an estate sale held in the home in December, in which my mom and I attended and I felt like they were asking way too much for this incredibly outdated house. March rolls around, and the house still hasn't sold, but they dropped the price down a bit, and my fiancé and I decided to make an offer. They countered, and we accepted. Life was great. We were homeowners and had the best neighbours in the world, my mom and stepdad. It felt like such a blessing for us to have my parents next door, especially since my fiancé and I have two young kids aged one and six at the time we purchased the house. I also work opposite shifts of my fiancé, so if he needs to run to the store or whatever while I'm working, my mom or stepdad would come over and watch them for 20 minutes. They were there to help with every detail, from doing a complete living room remodel to borrowing us tools and whatever we needed. My stepdad would even help with our lawn care, and my fiancé would help with their snow removal. In December of 2020, my stepdad started getting sick. He had vertigo that wouldn't go away. His doctor prescribed him mesalazine, and after weeks and weeks of it not going away, his doctor referred him to an ENT. The ENT was under the impression that he was suffering from mid-aries. A week or two after seeing the ENT, he woke up one morning, unable to walk. So we went back to his doctor yet again, and his doctor thought maybe he had a stroke in his cerebellum, so we sent him in for an MRI. The MRI unfortunately showed a tumour on his cerebellum the size of a large grape. They also found tumours on both adrenal glands and one in his lung. The diagnosis was stage 4 adenocarcinoma. Three months to the day after his diagnosis, my stepdad passed away in the comfort of his home with my mum and I by his side and holding his hand. I was there for the whole process between his hospital stay, rehab, and then finally him coming home on hospice. I stayed up with him the night it became clear that he was dying. I made all the phone calls to the hospice and the family after he passed. I wrote every word of his obituary. Living next door, I've been able to spend a lot of time with my mother and help her through the grief of it all since he passed. It's become very clearly evident that it was more of a blessing for my mom to have me next door than it was for me to have her next door. I should also add that within a few days of my stepdad's passing, I believe he sent me a sign. My fiancé and I were sitting outside and saw a hummingbird trying to feed from my sage plant that was blooming. I've never seen a hummingbird in the city I live in. It's too busy. We're not near any wooded areas. In fact, we're a block away from a very busy road. 
My mom and stepdad used to live in the next city over, and they lived next to a huge field, and there were woods not too far from their house. She used to get hummingbirds frequently, and my stepdad loved to watch them. When they moved to the house my mom is currently living in now, she tried for several years with the hummingbird feeder, and not once did she get one. So it was quite a surprise to see this one right after his passing. So here's where my current story begins. This past Tuesday was the one year anniversary of my stepdad's official cancer diagnosis. My mom has been having a really tough week because of it, and I think she's finally entering the anger stage of grief. On Wednesday, I was home with the kids. My fiance works regular business hours and I work nights. I have a really weird eating schedule because I keep odd hours to begin with. He came home from work a little after five like normal and I wasn't feeling right. Lightheaded, kind of dizzy. I sent him out for food thinking I just needed to eat something because I'd been up for about five hours and hadn't eaten yet. So we had dinner and I still wasn't feeling well. I was laying in bed at 3am and the whole room was just spinning. I was starting to feel really nauseous and it hit me that maybe I was having a migraine but without the headache. So I woke my other half up and had him get me an Imitrex because I couldn't focus on anything but the spinning at the time, let alone trying to walk down a flight of stairs to find some beds. Thursday, I woke up still dizzy, but it was short-lived and went away after an hour or so. Is where it gets really interesting. Friday, I woke up and felt fine still. I was scheduled to work that night and needed to wash my hair and do all the things to get ready for my work weekend. I have pink and purple hair currently, and to keep the colour from fading, I wash it in cold water by draping my head under the faucet of the bathtub versus taking a freezing cold shower. So mid-hair washing, the world starts spinning again. I gracefully managed to stumble my way over to my mom's house because I knew she would help guide me through that manoeuvre you could do for Vertigo. And she did. And she offered me some meclizine, which is basically like Dramamine. She still had some of her medicine cabinet from my stepdad when he was experiencing Vertigo on a daily basis. So my mom proceeds to tell me I can't go into work like this. I can't safely drive there. And I'm like, ah, oh, crap, she's right. So I made the decision to call her to work. About two hours later, I took her up on the meclizine offer, knowing I had already called her to work. So if I got drowsy, no big deal. I'm not going in. Around 8pm, I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer. So I took a nap on the couch. I woke up from some strange dreams around 10pm. My fiancé was watching some serial killer docuseries, so that explained my dreams. And I woke up feeling overheated and decided to go out to our breezeway to cool off a bit and wake up. When I hit the stairs to my back entry, which also leads to my basement, something smelled weird, like it was burning. The smell was overpowering. I looked around and didn't see smoke anywhere, but started calling for my fiancé, worried it was in the basement. Three steps down I could handle, but not the 10 or 12 to go down the basement while I was still dizzy, and now feeling drugged out and drowsy from the med I'd taken. So he goes and checks out the basement, and says the smell stops midway down the stairs. It's not coming from the breeze while you're outside. We have several switches in this back entry. One that powers an outside light pole in our side yard, one for the light in the breezeway, and one for the basement, then one that turns the power on and off to the garage, which is always on because of the garage door opener. So he starts checking the switches, and the one for the power to the garage is hot. He runs back downstairs and flips the breaker to that switch, and grabs a screwdriver to take the plate off, and the switch is frying. He says to me, thank god you noticed this. Two hours later, this whole experience was kind of weighing on my mind really heavily. And I kept thinking it was such a good thing that I didn't go into work tonight. Because who knows how much longer we would have until an electrical fire started. And that's when it hit me. I was home because I was having the same symptoms my stepdad was having from his brain tumour before his past. Is this him warning me? Protecting my family and I? My fiancé replaced the switch this morning and I think we'll be calling an electrician to come check everything else out. 
I've never in my life had an experience on this level before. I woke up today feeling about 80% better as well. This happened when I was seven years old. I'm sharing because my older brother reminded me of it. Now that I'm 24, and now I can't get it out of my head. This was very traumatic for me because after this event, a bunch of other things started to happen. This is how it started. Growing up and now, I live in a haunted state. I lived five miles away from the most victorious haunted forest. My mom used to tell my brothers and I about what she would hear walking by the forest, the murders that happen, and how she used to see pukwudgies. My older brother, 11 at the time, let's call him D, and I were watching TV in the living room. It was dark outside. It must have been a new moon. If you're sitting on the couch and look to your right, you would see the glass sliding door, which viewed the backyard. Mind you, it was an acre lawn and tall trees lined the perimeter. I was tired and decided to get my ritual glass of milk before to bed. When I stood up and saw what was glaring at me through the glass door. It was tall, taller than the fucking door. It was skinny in the torso, but its chest was broad. It was white, with tall ears. I want to say it looked like the white version of Donnie Darko. I was about 15 feet from the glass door. I froze. It didn't move. It just kept looking at me. It couldn't have been anyone else because we lived in the middle of the woods. I started calling for my brother's name, but D wasn't answering me. I started to get louder, now calling for my mom. Her room was on the other side of the couch, so she was there in a heartbeat. She looked at the back door, looked at Dee, then told me to just sit back down. I couldn't understand why I was the only one freaking the fuck out. I laid on the couch, facing away from the glass door. Dee put a blanket on me, and we both fell asleep on the couch. Well, 2021, Dee calls me from jail. He's been in and out since I was 13. This is how the conversation went. D, hey, can I ask you something? Me, what's up? Do you remember that night? What night? That night where you were freaking out. We were young. Remember that tall, scary looking shit that was at the back door? I have a flashback of that night. Look, I had a dream about it last night. I wanted to tell you that I saw it too. I was too scared to do anything. Mom saw it also. The conversation ended because he only had so much time on the phone. I felt relief that I knew I wasn't just having a schizophrenic hallucination episode, but my body went numb from the memory of being so scared. I told my SO about it. He's my best friend. He told me that I came face to face with a Wendigo and how he wasn't surprised because of the small country town I lived in. When I looked up what a Wendigo was, my heart sank. That's what I saw. It's been a year since I was reminded of it. I believe it still follows me. My siblings and I grew up in a pretty traumatic environment. When my oldest sibling, five years older than me, became a teenager, they became a very real risk to my safety. Their bedroom was right next to mine and I was regularly threatened with things that would be done to me in my sleep. One particular bad night, a figure showed up in my bedroom doorway. He looked like the guy from the movie Green Mile. He was massive and wearing overalls. I could see him as clearly as I could see anyone, but no one else could. He freaked me out and my parents eventually had to get a beaded curtain from my doorway and make another sibling swap bedrooms with the oldest. But looking back as an adult, I think he was protecting me. When he was in my doorway, no one ever came in my room. My volatile sibling would be calmer and their threats would fade. A couple of years ago, we had someone enter our home while I was asleep. I woke up to someone opening my bedroom door. That night, the figure reappeared in my doorway. I hadn't seen or even thought about him in years. But that night, there he was, clear as day. I think this figure was there to protect me and help lessen the trauma I was subjected to as a child. 
My mum remembers me being so afraid of the figure in my doorway and that I could always clearly describe him. Even now, 25 plus years on, I can see him clearly in my mind. I wish I wasn't so afraid whenever he showed up. A mate of mine in recent years said he was a poltergeist and if my sibling had followed through on my threat, I would have seen real evil out of him. But I really don't know. So this happened a few years ago. But first, a bit about my uncle, Paulinho. He was an alcoholic, died of cancer, and was battling with alcoholism his whole life. He started drinking in his teens, and this kept going and turned into an addiction. My cousin's life was pretty hard, as my uncle neglected him through his infancy, and money was an issue. My uncle developed throat cancer in his 40s and had to quit drinking to have a chance. He actually managed to stop drinking and smoking and fought the hell out of the cancer. He then went 20 years without drinking or smoking until he developed a new cancer and this time he didn't have the strength to fight the addiction and died drinking and smoking. He was a loving man, funny and really helpful, but he was stigmatized within the family because of his addiction. I was living with him and my grandmother at the time as I was attending college in the city where they lived. My uncle used to help her as she can't walk, but he wasn't doing much since the disease came back, and I picked up on taking care of her alongside one of my aunts. I tried to be supportive for him, but I know how hard it was for him to deal with the addiction and the cancer again. I really cared for him, and the worst was feeling everyone draw away from him as he was slowly dying. At the funeral, he was in the coffin in the middle of the room, and we were all around him. When the time came, People started talking about him and I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. He had a neutral look, but you could distinguish sadness in his face, especially in his mouth. Everyone that spoke said good things about him, but they all mentioned his disease or the addiction, or how it was hard dealing with that, the sadness of watching him go back to it, etc. I wanted to say only good things about him, but I had no strength. But after my cousin spoke, his wife started talking and only said fun things about him. The times he helped her and how he was like a father she never had. And some funny situations. It was the only time that I took my eyes off of him because the speech was so moving. And because it was really representative of his good nature. What I wanted to say, but didn't manage to. When I looked back at him, he had a distinct smile on his face. He seemed genuinely happy at her words and how everybody was laughing and remembering him in a good light. Not throwing any criticism or paying attention to his flaws. It really amused me, and I'm a big non-believer of life after death, but that's something I really can't explain. I wish I could say it was only my perception because of the moment, but I genuinely saw a smile on his face that faded away a few moments later. Around 10 or so years ago, my little brother was about two years old, just learning how to speak and develop into the toddler stage, and I was around 12 or so years old, being the oldest sibling, with my two middle siblings in between me and my youngest brother that I'm talking about here. We had a family party celebrating my birthday that year, and the extended family was over for dinner and cake and presents, all sharing stories, watching the game on TV, etc., then my mom and aunt decided to get out the old family album from when they were kids and talk about old memories and share them with those kids who were not alive for it back then. They came across a few pictures of my late uncle Chris who died before I was born of cancer and was really close to my mom's siblings, my mom especially. I only ever heard stories growing up about him from my mother and other members of the family but never got to meet him and my little brother certainly never met him and also barely comprehended or heard any stories or seen any pictures of him up until that point in his life, being only two years old at the time. My mom pulled out a picture of Chris in his graduation uniform, and before she could even start explaining the picture, my little brother looked at the picture and started smiling and laughing a little bit and said, hey, it's Chrissy. Chrissy was a nickname given to Chris by some people in the family as well as his close friends back when he was alive. 
and not even what my mother referred to him as even when talking to me growing up. After he said that, my mom and aunt just looked at each other, mildly creeped out at first, followed by amazement and a deep debate about how the hell that was possible. As well as my grandma coming in being very spiritual, like I bet him and Chris are good friends. That would be just like Chris too. I was confused as hell myself, not understanding how he recognised him without ever seeing him before. Being a young two-year-old who could barely even form coherent sentences the majority of the time. I also have quite a lot of stories with my younger sister, as well as faint memories from my own childhood that have really convinced me of this theory furthermore. But I'm curious what other people think about this, or what other similar experiences people have. When I was small, I used to live in a big old house, in a small village with my parents and my grandma. The house was at least like a hundred years old, and we bought it from the local priest who had lived there before. Normally, I didn't experience many scary things, just a few weird sounds. I'd note that I've always been scared of the dark, even now as a 20 year old. I hate being alone in the dark, and I write it off in this house. As a kid, I had nightmares and recurring dreams very often, and I still do to this day. And exactly because of this, since my bedroom used to be right next to my grandma's bedroom from the right and my parents' bedroom for the left, I would always open the door to either room at night to feel safe by their small sounds and the TV light shining in. This night, it wasn't that late, probably around 7 to 8 p.m., and I was playing Smite on my laptop. The door to my grandma's room was closed, but on the other side, the door to my parents' bedroom was halfway open. From my desk I was sitting at, I could see straight into their room. It was dark inside. My parents weren't home yet, but I was expecting them to arrive any second. At one point, I heard someone in the room, so I turned my head, and I saw something move in there. It was this slightly glowing white figure that I mistook for my mom somehow. Without a thought, I said, hey mom, but got no response. When I doubled back to check the room, it was absolutely still and dark inside. I freaked the fuck out and ran to my grandma's bedroom, but I never actually told anyone in my family what I saw, because I was sure I was just seeing things because of looking at my laptop screen for too long. Years later, we moved out with my parents, and it was only my grandma left in that big house alone. She told me sometimes she would hear footsteps in her room going around in a circle, when she was taking a nap in the late afternoon hours. But as soon as she opened her eyes, the noises would stop. Sadly, my grandma recently passed away, so I couldn't discuss it with her further. And to be honest, I'm kind of uneasy thinking about going back to that house. We'll most likely sell it if we gain ownership. Back in the year 2012, I had a heart transplant. Ever since, on occasion, something strange would happen. Usually when I was about to do something I probably shouldn't be doing or mention the donor's name. May 2021. The first time I noticed something weird was when I was lying in bed and the door to the office adjacent to my bedroom was closing by itself. It was slowly shutting and I dismissed it as the AC turning on or something like that. But I remembered that the carpet in the office has a lump in it, and you have to apply a good bit of force to the door to get it over the lump in the carpet. I got up and searched my house to see if anyone was up, and they weren't. November 22. After that, I was on the phone, and I happened to be discussing the donor. Almost instantly after seeing the donor's name, the lamp next to me started blinking off and on. This is strange, but I could chalk that up to a loose connection in the lamp. January 2022, I was hanging out with friends and they asked me to retell my story about the heart transplant. Shortly after, we were messing around and took a video. However, when we replayed the video, an orb went across the screen and completely covered my friend's face. It's probably just dust. March 2022, 
Today I was working on my car out in the garage and I had to get up under the car to pop the oil drain plug out. I was feeling lazy and didn't put jack stands under the car. Right as I was about to slide up under the car, a wrench fell off the top of the toolbox. The top of the toolbox has a rubber mat to stop tools from falling off. That was the last straw that made me make a post about this. I'm a complete skeptic when it comes to ghosts, but I thought you guys would at least find it interesting. Even though professionally I'm a chaplain who deals with the supernatural, I'm surrounded by people who load and assume stuff about my experiences. I don't know who I helped that has something seriously powerful attached to them, which is scary enough as it is. I tried to dismiss this kind of stuff, and my first rationalisation was bugs, but I can't really ignore or dismiss it anymore. There's a room we're next to that I've written about. I still follow my practices, warding with prayer, crosses, incense, bibles, but there are two spots of faltering. Number one is when I'm at my computer desk. My legs are up against the wall to the creepy room. Several times throughout the hours I'm sitting at my computer, I can feel a hand grab or slightly yank my foot. It's cold. It's also incredibly annoying. The other spot is when I'm sleeping and my leg is uncovered. I get small yanks as I'm falling asleep. Or some that wake me up. Same deal. Ice cold for the briefest second. Really weak grab or yank. And then nothing. I woke up with the random scratches up my leg one morning, but I'm going to assume it was my dog. I'm a chaplain for a community church. I deal with many things. One of the aspects of my role is dealing with the spiritual world. I'm specialised in dealing with what we call spiritual warfare, demons or dark spirits. Keep in mind, I'm not trying to convert or evangelise you, but it's better to know what opinions you have. My advice will be both Christian and general, and comes from a place of study and lifelong interaction with the spiritual world. First, what's a chaplain? A chaplain is a church minister or representative who works in the community, or in the secular or non-religious world, to give mental, physical or spiritual advice. The advice is often non-religious, although the chaplain is religious. Chaplains will use all the tools in their toolkit to help someone, which includes counselling, referring to health services, or engaging in religious support like prayer, blessing or protection. With the person if they're willing, on behalf of the person when they're not present if they're not willing. The best verse to describe a chaplain is, always be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Let's get into this. Always look for the scientific or rational explanation first. Never first assume it's spiritual until you have the inexplicable. And search hard for logical reasons for signs. Tick all of the boxes in order to be certain. This is a big category I will not be able to fully cover. There'll be some stuff missing. Here's the general signs I've seen in person. Foul, inexplicable smells. Footsteps, scratching, knocking, temperature fluctuation, whispering, feeling of being watched, Inexpl inexplicable movement of items. Small, visible movements like pulling on blankets or knocking items over. Physical touching, as in being touched, poked, prodded or grabbed, etc. And sleep paralysis. Hauntings of an individual. This is much more difficult and very complex. A complete change in attitude or behaviour. Growling or groaning for no reason. Sudden memory loss with no reason. Inexplicable anger and mood shifts. Hostility to spiritual practice or people. Foaming in the mouth. Sudden substance abuse. Standing and staring for long periods of time. Addictions. Dangerous and self-harming attitudes and behaviour. If it knocks or calls, do not answer. One of the most common beliefs across religions and beliefs is that dark spirits or demons 
require permission to possess a personal area or to tether to someone and haunt them. But this permission doesn't always need to be explicit. Dark spirits are infamously tricky. Knocking on something and having it open for you is the most simple and common form of invitation there is. Like being let through someone's front door after knocking, the invitation is implicit. They'll also do things like imitate loved ones, or target children because children have an incredibly active imagination. Not to worry you, but sometimes an imaginary friend is not so imaginary. But if it calls to you, or knocks, my suggestion is always to rebuke. Rebuke and ward. My rebuke is, I do not permit you. You are not welcome here. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. For non-religious rebuking, obviously take out the in the name of Jesus stuff. Warding is when you put crosses or protections on doorways, or regular blessings and cleansing. Non-religious warding would be making sure to shut and even lock all doors. Never, under any circumstance, try to communicate with these spirits. Some spirits are benevolent, but if it's trying to trick you, it's evil and has to be rebuked. Some examples I've seen have been knocking on windows, porch doors, walls, bedroom doors, or even front doors. Or pretending to be a loved one calling out to elicit a come here. All of these instances require strength, courage, and firm words. Sinister spirits love fear. So find whatever it is that bolsters you and use it. Obviously for me, it's Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. White sage is not a cure-all. So often, we see people advocating the use of white sage. But this can be a bit of a misnomer. White sage is a native North American practice. Dark spirits respect authority. We don't know why, and there are many theories. But for whatever reason, the spiritual world respects authority. If you're not Native American and you wave white sage around to cleanse a house, it will not fully do so because you don't have the authority to practice. It's also because white sage is for certain kinds of cleansings, more responsive in nature, like someone dying in a house. For an alternative example, as a Western chaplain, I'll use frankincense and myrrh, and it's worked every time I've used it to cleanse a house or bless someone. When I was younger, I tried sage, and I worsted the symptoms of haunting, hence the investigation into it. Dark spirits are angry and malevolent, and if you show you know they're there, and you're trying to get rid of them, but don't actually get rid of them, you'll anger them. My suggestion for a cleansing is to find a spiritual elder. A spiritual elder could be a chaplain from a local church, or it could be a shaman from the local tribe. Either way, you need someone with authority who knows what they're doing. Don't try and fix these things alone by essentially co-opting another culture or religious practice. You don't have the authority to do so. However, I will say you can still rebuke. This point is absolutely about the use of symbols, herbs, incense, and other cleansing rituals. You can still command something to leave you and your house or family alone. Immature interaction with the spiritual world is hugely dangerous. Things follow you. It's the same old trope, but it's a trope for a reason. A seance in a graveyard, a Ouija board at a party, going to a haunted abandoned building in the night. All these things we love to do to scare ourselves. All of these things are intensely dangerous. I can't tell you how many times my support has basically been a spiritual inv investigation to find and solve a cause. If you know where it came from, or what it's connected to, much easier to deal with a malevolent spirit. That being said, it's also one of the most common reasons I've seen for hauntings. People have invited the interest of a spirit with their silly behaviour, and it's just not worth the risk. If you want to experience it, experience it vicariously through videos, and let other people take the risk. If you do muck around, you know what I'm going to say. Find yourself a chaplain or spiritual leader. Get yourself in your living environment blessed, rebuke, and ward. Of course, my first suggestion is going to be don't muck around with it. Also, to cover here, things like living on native burial grounds, haunted forests and graveyards, all require specific interventions. You need to know the problem. For example, living on a native burial ground or battleground, 
A grievance has occurred and there are angry spirits. Anything to do with wrongdoing toward the native population requires native reconciliation, ritual, and intervention. Benevolent spirits. These definitely exist. You'll find conflicting information surrounding benevolent spirits and what to do with them. But personally, my suggestion will be to move them on. Sometimes they are malevolent spirits up to no good and tricking you. But sometimes they are the spirits of loved ones. However, they don't belong here anymore. Grief can be a powerful tool. So too can love. If you think it's truly the benevolent spirit of a loved one, then if you love them, let them go. Give them peace and freedom, bless them, and cleanse the environment. Magic and witchcraft. As a Christian chaplain, my job is to tell you to avoid this. However, the reality is that plenty of people engage in this area of the supernatural perfectly safely. If you are a Wiccan or a determined practitioner, my only request is that you find someone in your faith to mentor you so that you can do it safely. People messing around in witchcraft without having an elder to guide them is another horrendously dangerous way of inviting malevolent spirits. And I admit, the same can be said about many Christian practices. Sleep paralysis or supernatural? This is probably the most common question I see, but there's a relatively simple answer. Is there anything else going on other than sleep paralysis? While sleep paralysis can be terrifying and a tool of dark spirits, sometimes it is simply sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is when your conscious and subconscious have not fully reconnected, but you're awake, but not yet physically in control. Supernatural occurrences usually bring in a whole raft of other things. Unable to sleep because it feels like you're being watched. Others telltale signs of hauntings like light switches turning on and off in the night, footsteps, temperature fluctuations. If you're not sure, my suggestion is to sleep on your side as often as possible. If it's sleep paralysis, it'll still happen. If it's supernatural, it'll stop because you can no longer so easily be pinned. The single most helpful piece of advice, be courageous and remember that fear and anger are the same emotion with different responses. Current evidence indicates they're from the same part of the brain. The purpose for many cultural war dancers was to turn fear into anger. For the Christians, it's a lot easier or any faith practitioner really. For me, when I'm confronted with something spiritual, I stick to my go-to, I do not permit you, you are not welcome, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. If you can't muster the ability to be clear, logical or concise, then I honestly recommend you get angry and let it be known. How fucking dare this thing come into your house and fuck with you? How dare it follow you around and make your life harder? Tell it to fuck off. It's an old church, but not like cool old. It's not Victorian. It was built in the 40s, but it's a community church in a poor area. And we've seen some broken souls come through the doors. We're open to any and everyone. We're probably the most accepting church I know of, but this does result in a lot of sad stories. I'm a chaplain, but I don't force my beliefs on anyone. And I'm not here to evangelize you. I work alone in the church often, it's a low paying job. I'm the only full time worker for the church, but I do it because my background is in working with kids and young people who are on a trajectory to join a gang. I have a degree in youth development, masters in community leadership, and I'm trained in institutionalized psychology and chaplaincy. I don't do it for the money. I have a belief that our church is either haunted or targeted by spirits because of the work we do in the community. We're grassroots. Humility is key. And we're not afraid of spiritual warfare, which mostly looks like counselling people who are scared, giving out food boxes to the needy, blessing new buildings or places of death, lots of different spiritual things. My belief is that as a consequence of the people we help and the things we do, we draw negative spiritual attention to ourselves. I got a video the other day. I don't want it to go viral. I'll get in trouble with my church. But it was the usual. Doors opening and closing themselves, and heavy footsteps in the church area while I was alone, and all doors and windows closed. I work in a small chapel office off to the side. 
The main building is usually locked up for tight security reasons. Even has a different alarm. To start with, my real parents died in a car accident, and I got adopted from when I was around the age of four. I've always seen this tall, dark figure at the end of my bed or corner of the room in my dreams. It didn't have a hat or brim, and it was always darker than the room it was in. It happens about three times a week, or if I go anywhere new or overnight. Each house I've lived in, I've seen it. If I go to a friend's house overnight, then it would be there too. I always thought it was just me being crazy and overthinking things. There was no way I could tell people, and I didn't want to come off as that weirdo who sees things. While I was dating my husband, I saw it as this. I didn't say anything. We're now married, and we have our five-month-old. Literally the other day, I told him a weird dream I had of the black tall thing coming up the stairs. It opening the door and just staring at me and our baby. He turned white. He said he'd seen the exact same dream last night. We shared the same dream. Upon talking, he admitted he'd seen it for a while. He only saw it when he started dating me, and obviously sees it often now in whatever house we're in. We've recently moved to, and he saw it the first night. In the hospital I gave birth in, because of the big C word, my husband had to go home on his own the very first night. I got moved to a ward and nurses would come check on myself and baby, come do my blood pressure and just take care of you until the morning. I was going home the next day. I saw whatever it was just standing outside the curtain rail of the hospital bed, watching us. One nurse came to take my vitals and I heard her gasp and she shoved on the lights, blinding me in the process. She apologised quickly and said she's had a long night and apologised again for blinding me. She did a full look of the room before she left and made sure to leave the bedside table lamp on. The weird thing that happened was the first night of me being out of hospital and at home with our newborn baby. It was there in the corner. He said it saw it look at me and then look down and into the crib and then just turned to leave. I'm now currently scared because it's validated that something is following me. I don't think it's evil. I think it's watching over me and now our baby.